your screen. Sandeep, you are live now. Sandeep? One yeah. message if you are live. Right. Yeah. One minute. Yes, we are live. Welcome, friends, uh, to the uh, Indian Arthroscopy Society evening webinar today. We have a special guest today, uh, Dr. Nikhil Verma. And I think all the members of Indian Arthroscopy Society who have been attending arthroscopy meetings in the country, India and abroad, are familiar with him. He has come to uh, India to, uh, to demonstrate surgeries, to give lectures as well. And he's uh, a lead faculty in arthroscopy, in Arthroscopy Association of North America as well. Uh, Dr. Nikhil works in Chicago and he's actually associated with many sports teams, Red, Red Sox and uh, uh, baseball teams of Chicago as well. I must thank Dr. Deepak Chaudhary for facilitating this uh, web webinar. Uh, let me ask Deepak to just give a small brief about uh, Nikhil and then we go to Nikhil uh, for his presentation. Deepak, please. Thanks, IPS. Uh, today, management of shoulder instability has been challenging the arthroscopic surgeons all over the world. And in spite of improvements, better understanding of the anatomy, biomechanical principles, and better surgical outcomes, the ideal treatments still eludes us. So at one extreme, we have in India uh, bank cards being done for, for considerable bone loss and with good success. And on the other hand, we have French surgeons who do latter jet in the first instance. So the jury is still not out. And to give us a broad perspective on this, we have a very internationally renowned surgeon uh, uh, of Indian origin, that is Dr. Nikhil Verma. He is in, based in Chicago and he is the director professor of uh, orthopedics and sports medicine there at the Rush Medical Center. And he has been voted by the peers, by his peers as one of the best doctors in America every year since 2007. As IPS said, for the Chicago team physician for the Chicago. He has authored multiple manuscripts in major orthopedics and sports medicine journals, besides writing various book chapters, and routinely serves as the teaching faculty for orthopedic courses on advanced surgical techniques. He is also an uh, editorial board member of the Arthroscopic Journal and as well as of the Journal of Knee Surgery. Uh, Dr. Nikhil Verma, please. Thanks very much. Are you guys able to see that at this point? Yeah, yeah Nikhil, we can. Okay, great. Well, first of all, uh, it's obviously obvi an honor to uh, be present with you this morning. I've had the opportunity to visit India both uh, personally, but also professionally uh, on several occasions uh, and have been involved with the Indian Arthroscopy Society at their annual meetings, as well as the combined meetings with the Asian uh, Pacific Arthroscopy Society. And it's always been a great pleasure for me to spend time in India and, and uh, learn from, from you and participate in your educational activities. Um, as uh, was discussed earlier, we're gonna talk uh, today about uh, shoulder instability and uh, basically, Sorry. We'll talk about the spectrum of pathology talk today that, about uh, shoulder instability. And I'm not sure. Uh, give me one second. No worries. Talk uh, today about. Uh, so, shoulder instability, as was already discussed, is basically a spectrum spectrum of pathology. It, it uh, is something that confuses us. It's something that is sometimes difficult to make decisions about how to best manage patients. And we're going to give you, um, or I will share with you my overview about what we've learned over the last 15 years about managing shoulder instability and how we make decisions in 2020 in treating these uh, types of patients. Uh, my disclosures are available through the Academy's online disclosure uh, program, and uh, none are directly relevant to the content of this talk. So I thought it'd be helpful to just present a case to begin with. This was a 19 year old uh, male. He plays American football. So obviously a very heavy contact sport. He also plays basketball. He's graduating from high school this year and would like to play at the collegiate level uh, the following year. He's dislocated his right shoulder six times over two years, all traumatic in nature. And the most recent dislocation was about a week ago and he was able to self-reduce at that time. 
He reports that he has soreness, but has restored full range of motion. He has not returned to practice to date. We can look at his radiographs and show that his glenohumeral joint is really normal on the AP view. On the axillary view, we get a sense that there may be some loss of the normal sharp edge of the anterior glenoid margin that may suggest some form of a, a Bankart lesion uh, with associated bony involvement. If we look at his MRI scan, it's fairly clear that there's an obvious labral tear that may lead us to suggest some form of labral reconstruction. But as is my practice, a CT scan uh, shows us clearly uh, that there's some involvement of the anterior inferior glenoid, a small bone lesion that's been associated with chronic instability, and really probably somewhere in the neighborhood of a 15 to 20% bone deficiency with uh, partial uh, bony bank art availability. So if we ask ourselves, you know, what are the options for management of this patient? I think all of us could make an argument for any one of the following uh, treatment options. That would include an arthroscopic bank art repair, a bank art repair with including posterior plication, an arthroscopic bank art repair with a remplissage type procedure, an open surgical stabilization with bank art repair and capsular plication, and some form of bone reconstruction that would primarily be managed with latter J coracoid transfer. And this is the problem with instability is how do we select which is the best option for the individual patient in order to achieve not only uh, elimination of recurrence of instability, but also uh, allowing that patient to return to their desired activity level with a good functional recovery. We know that the history of instability is uh, uh, fairly uh, unique. We started with non-anatomic procedures, anterior capsular tightening procedures and or bone transfer procedures such as the Magnuson stack or putty plat. We then went to open labral repair with some form of capsular shift. And in the last 15 years or so, we've really evolved to primarily using arthroscopy uh, in managing instability with uh, uh, bank heart repair and capsular plication. We know that uh, particularly in the last 10 years, we've moved primarily to an arthroscopic approach. And if we look at some of the early data, uh, it would suggest that arthroscopic, uh, arthroscopic stabilization can be equivalent to open stabilization when we look at outcomes in regards to recurrent instability. But we also know that instability is a long-term outcome uh, follow-up uh, procedure. If we follow our patients for a minimum of five years, we can find that our arthroscopic results are probably not as good as we think, with many studies reporting instability rates up to and above 20% following primary arthroscopic stabilization. So that really leads us to the question, is there a role for arthroscopic stabilization in 2020? And how do we identify those patients? And what is the best technique used to manage those patients? This is another paper that uh, kind of added fuel to the fire. This was a JBJS paper published from Canada uh, about five years ago now, where they looked in a randomized fashion at open instability versus arthroscopic stabilization the open recurrence rate was about 11%. The arthroscopic stabilization rate, recurrence rate was about 23%. But what's interesting is this was a JBJS publication, one of the strongest journals in our orthopedic landscape. But if you read it, there really is no description of the arthroscopic technique. And with direct communication with the authors, we find that this was done in a beach chair position. At times, PDS sutures were used for stabilization. The average number of anchors used during arthroscopy was only two. And so is there really a general applicability here to what we would consider a modern arthroscopic stabilization technique pattern? And this is the difficulty when we start to look at the literature is really establishing what is relevant, what is relevant to our practice and our technique, and how do we do that in a controlled fashion when comparing things like latter open, and arthroscopic. There's so many host factors, patient-specific factors, and technique factors that play into recurrence rates that it becomes very difficult to just generalize a single paper or a series of paper and extrapolate that to how it may influence our individual practices. We know that uh, there are a number of factors that may predict a recurrence. These include uh, things like the age of the patient. Uh, younger patients are clearly at higher risk with uh, recurrence rates below 15, approaching 90% with non-operative treatment. We know the number of dislocations predict recurrent instability and the watershed number seems to be somewhere between three and five at which point we can expect higher failure rates following soft tissue stabilization. We know the athletic participation, probably those involved in contact sports or collision sports are at highest risk. And of course, we know there are, are pathognomonic or pathoanatomic uh, factors such as bone loss that can occur either on the glenoid side, the humeral side, or commonly in a bipolar nature. Now, many have attempted to try to create scoring scales that help us to predict
uh, what is the recurrence risk of an individual patient and thereby what procedure may be in indicated for that individual patient. Probably the most uh, uh, published or the most discussed is the ISIS score from Pascal Boileau in France, where he uses several factors, including the age of the patient, the degree of sports participation, the type of sports, the presence of hyperlaxity, and the appearance of bone loss on plain radiographs to try to predict the recurrence rate. And he noted that if the score was more than five, this would really put a patient at risk for recurrent instability. And he's suggested that in those patients, potentially an open latter transfer is indicated. But you can see that as we get into any patient who's young, participates in a contact sport that's of a, 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 a more than a recreational level, we're already a score of five, which means that almost any of these patients in his hands are indicated for a latter coracoid transfer. And I think many of that, us would consider that to be an over-aggressive approach. It's also important to note that nobody has really independently validated the score outside of his hands. And so I think we have to take into account our individual patient populations when making these types of decisions. I think it is clear that we've all often been reluctant to recommend early surgery for these patients. And unlike an ACL, where all of us would agree in a young uh, patient wishing to return to sports, an operation for an acute ACL tear would be indicated, we've been less likely to recommend early surgery in patients after a primary dislocation, despite the fact that there have been several prospective randomized trials that have clearly demonstrated improvement in patient reported outcomes and reduction in recurrent instability with primary surgery. This was a systematic review published in the Journal of uh, Arthroscopy that looked at 228 patients and noted that the recurrent instability rate is less than 10% following early surgery versus 60% in those treated conservatively. And we also see improvement in patient reported outcomes, uh, specifically the Western Ontario Stability Index. So I think it's clear if we look to the data alone, we do uh, need to start thinking about early surgery, particularly in those patients that are at risk for instability when our chance for uh, soft tissue reconstruction success is highest. We also know what happens if we don't operate. We see patients that have multiple recurrent instabilities events. We see patients that have progressive capsular attenuation. We see the development of bone loss, both on the glenoid and the humeral side, as well as osteoarthritis uh, risk that goes up over time. And so I think early stabilization, certainly by the second recurrent, should be the indication for surgery for most surgeons uh, in the vast majority of our patient populations. Success with arthroscopic stabilization, I think, can be achieved. Uh, critically, we need to pay, uh, select our patients appropriately. So this is an early intervention considered for stabilization in the first time dislocation. I think we should be cautious in the contact athlete, though with the right patient selection, we can still be successful. And of course, we need an appropriate preoperative workup to make sure that we're uh, eliminating patients that have significant bony defects from undergoing a soft per uh, tissue procedure alone. And finally, our surgical technique needs to be contemporary, and we'll show you how to do that uh, to achieve maximum success. So I do think that there is a role for arthroscopic surgery in 2020, uh, the indications we've already talked about. But as we move to the technique portion, I would ask you to consider patient positioning, the portal position, appropriate labral mobilization, management of the inferior component of instability, and learn to use both the five o'clock and the seven o'clock portals in order to maximize your chance of a successful outcome for your patient. The positioning, I think for those of you who do this operation routinely, um, we have transitioned fully at rush to the uh, lateral decubitus position. I think there are several advantages in that it provides hands-free lateral distraction uh, to distract the humeral wet head away from the glenoid. You can see the view you get from viewing from an anterior superior portal. So we can see the entire inferior three quarters of the glenoid and it facilitates access to both the, uh, the inferior posterior and inferior anterior quadrants. And it positions you at the head of the table that allows you freedom of access to both the front and the back of the shoulder without trying to reach across or particularly uh, what becomes difficult in the beach chair position is accessing and working on the posterior inferior quadrant, which is much easier for those of you who have tried this laterally. There is some data, uh, this is from our institution along with Matt Preventure, uh, where they looked at outcomes following stabilization done in a beach chair versus a lateral decubitus position, and they were able to determine that the lateral decubitus position is more successful in reducing the risk of subsequent instability. The portals that we use, I think you should be familiar with all. They include the posterior portal, which is our primary viewing site, an anterior superior portal that we'll use primarily uh, for placing the camera during the reconstruction position, the mid portal just above the subscap we're all familiar with as our primary working portal, uh, 
but be familiar with the seven o'clock portal and the five o'clock trans subscapularis portal, which are really critical to allow access to the inferior quadrants of the glenohumeral joint, which is where instability pathology primarily arises. These are the portals as you see them on the skin, and we'll show these to you arthroscopically and how to do this successfully. In addition, we have to be comfortable with all of the different types of instability pathology that we may encounter. This is an example of a typical Bankart lesion. So you can see there's some fraying of the slap, but it's uh, clearly attached. You can see the anterior inferior label tear that exists uh, below the three o'clock position on the glenoid. But importantly, as we look down to the bottom of the glenohumeral joint, we can see the significant capsular injury that occurs as a result of the instability pathology. And we need to be able to manage both the capsular component as well as the labral component. A second view looking down the front of the glenoid, this is the Alpsa lesion where the uh, uh, glenoid labrum and capsular complex is not only ruptured, but it's scarred in a medialized position. And you can see as we look down the front of the glenoid that this is commonly associated with bone loss conditions as well, which may be why we see higher recurrence rates associated with these Alpsa type tears. Finally, a, a, ha a Hagel lesion. As we look across from posterior, you may think that we're looking at the backside of the capsule when in fact we're looking at the backside of the subscapularis. And it's really not until we reach down with a grasper and identify the capsular leading edge. And you can see how I can raise the curtain. And this is clearly a lesion where the capsule has ruptured from the humeral side that needs to be repaired in either an arthroscopic or an open fashion. And finally, the GLAD lesion, where we see injury not only to the capsule and labral structures, but also to the articular surface of the glenoid, where we may need to think about some form of an articular reconstruction procedure. So all of these, along with uh, uh, capsular splits and other variations, are common instability pathology, and we need to be prepared to deal with any and all at the time of an instability surgery. The labral preparation is critical. My preference is to look from the anterior superior portal. This gives me the view down the front of the glenoid, as you see here. I can see all the way from the 2 o'clock position at the top uh, to the 6 o'clock position at the bottom. And we need to mobilize the labrum, resecting the labral and capsular tissue directly off of the glenoid margin until we can see the subscapularis underneath. <clears throat> this is the same case after labral mobilization. And you can see how the capsule labral structures now float up into a more anatomic position. And simply by repositioning the labrum in an anatomic position, we can also achieve capsular retentioning. So this form of labral mobilization is critical to achieving a proper outcome. As we start to think of our, about our construct for restoring capsule labral stability, remember that instability occurs in an inferior direction. It's generally an anterior inferior pathology or a posterior inferior pathology. So the zone of injury for a typical anterior instability problem is typically from the two o'clock position in the front of the shoulder to the seven o'clock position in the posterior aspect of the shoulder. And therefore, most of the times we are designing our suture construct to encompass this 180 degree arc of injury. And this includes different types of anchors and or super, uh, suture plication as the injury may call for. The seven o'clock portal, as I said, is critical. Um, at the top is a left shoulder, the bottom is a right shoulder, but basically we identify this portal by identifying the poster lateral corner of the acromion. And we drop straight down from there approximately three to four centimeters. And with percutaneous placement, you can see that we can achieve this excellent uh, orientation and angle of attack to place anchors in the uh, posterior inferior quadrant. And we can actually place an anchor all the way down at the six o'clock position. And my preference is to basically bookend anchors at 530 and 630 to manage the inferior component of instability. This is our technique as we've uh, uh, published. This is available on the arthroscopy techniques site. And it basically shows you how to do an arthroscopic instability repair uh, using these accessory portals. This is a right shoulder, so anterior is to the top of your screen, posterior is to the back of your screen. Uh, you can see that this is a large uh, uh, instability lesion that extends from about the two o'clock position in the front of the shoulder to uh, the nine o'clock position in the back of the shoulder, so almost 180 degree labeled tear. We established this uh, first portal in the mid-glenoid portion, a position that comes just above the subscapularis. <clears throat> We're gonna cre clean up some of this label fraying. And now this is the anterior superior portal that's established just posterior to the biceps. And this is the portal that I use my scope from. And you can see this wonderful view that it gives you looking down, uh, seeing the entire bottom half to two thirds of the glenoid. So we can work around the clock from this anterior portal, elevating the labrum and then preparing the glenoid margin, creating a light decortication in order to achieve uh, our repair. <clears throat> 
We're now establishing the uh, uh, seven o'clock portal so you can see a spinal needle localization. We essentially uh, place this portal parallel to the glenoid. A switching stick is introduced. <clears throat> this will be our, our portal for uh, primarily for management of our sutures. And then we place an uh, eight uh, millimeter cannula, which will allow us to place curved suture passing devices. I do like to place my anchors through a second percutaneous approach. This just allows me to get vertical to the glenoid so that I avoid any skiving of the articular cartilage. So here you can see the first anchor being placed down low at the 530 position. This is about the six o'clock position. Uh, I would call this 630 actually, and 530 is here. So these are double loaded all suture anchors. They create a very small penetration within the bone, generally somewhere between 1.4 to 1.6 millimeters. We place the anchors and then we use a curved suture passing device in order to place uh, simple suture configurations through the capsule label complex. So this is typical suture shuttling that is done. We retrieve one of the sutures from the anterior mid glenoid portal. We grab about a, a seven to 10 millimeter bite of capsule label complex. We always wanna come below the anchor. So we're shifting the capsule and labrum, not only in a medial lateral direction, but also in an inferior to superior direction. And in this situation, these are small uh, O uh, sutures, uh, high strength, so they're equivalent to a number two suture, but we place them in a simple configuration. And because these are double loaded, we essentially get two points of fixation for every anchor placement. So this uh, develops a very strong and robust uh, complex for our repair. You can see the sutures are tied as we go. We start with our lowest suture. We're now gonna place an additional anchor at about the 730 position. So this is managing the inferior component of the instability problem. Again, we simply place these sutures in a simple configuration, and this will complete our posterior inferior repair, and then we'll move to the anterior aspect of the joint. Next, we're gonna move anteriorly. So I actually like to place my first suture passage using this posterior portal. And what this allows me to do is to get this suture down low and then establish a trans subscapularis portal in order to place my anchor in an orthogonal position to the 530 position on the glenoid. So you can see we've made a very small stab wound in the um, inferior aspect of the shoulder. This comes just above the axillary crease. We penetrate just with the anchor insertion tool. So it's a very small penetration through the subscapularis. We've already got our, our passage suture from the posterior uh, quadrant for the inferior suture. And then we come through the mid glenoid portion uh, for our more superior suture. And this is really gonna allow us to place four sutures between 530 and 630 that allows us to complete the repair in the inferior aspect of the glenohumeral joint. So as we already showed you in the back, we simply shuttle these sutures through. Uh, you can do simple configurations, mattress configurations, a combination of mattress and simple configurations. Matt Preventure and I have looked at that in the lab and found that really it doesn't matter the type of suture configuration you use. The key is to place the suture anchors in the proper position. And then we move up the front of the glenoid in order to complete our repair. But once you get the inferior quadrant managed, uh, we then just need to simply perform a capsule label repair more superiorly, and that'll complete our final construct. And here's what it looks like. You can see that we've got about six anchors from the front of the glenoid all the way to the back of the glenoid using a combination of double and single loaded, and that should give us the best chance of a successful outcome for this patient. What about remplissage? Uh, my indications for remplissage are when we have smaller glenoid defects, so less than 10%. Humeral defects that are medium to large, greater than 20%. This is a fairly uncommon scenario. It's generally less than 10% of your instability population. But here's an example of a patient that has uh, the, the uh, uh, aforementioned criteria. And this is our technique for remplissage repair. So you can see we're working through our standard posterior portal. We're still visualizing through that anterior superior portal. You can see very clearly the uh, uh, hill sacs lesion and the island of remaining cartilage that exists between the hill sacs and the bare area. We're simply going to take this down and lightly decorticate in order to create a bleeding surface for healing. We like to pass, place these sutures during the first part of our repair and then complete our bank heart repair and then go up and tension the sutures. In this case, I'm using a knotless all suture implant. So I'm simply going to penetrate the posterior rotator cuff and capsular complex in the inferior aspect. We like to place these sutures close to the articular margin, but you need to make sure that you angle the guide so that you don't penetrate the articular cortex. And we're constantly checking to make sure that we're doing that. We simply place the anchor <clears throat> in a percutaneous fashion. The anchor is being inserted now. 
And then we're going to pull back that guide, leaving the anchor and passage sutures in place. And then we simply move to our more superior location. We don't have to do any suture passing because we've already penetrated both the rotator cuff as well as the capsule. And then we're going to make a second penetration in a more superior position using, again, just the guide that's used to place these knotless all suture anchor devices. So here you see us bringing the guide into place. We'll come back up on top. We're now in a superior position. We're coming just off the articular margin. You can see that our anchors are spaced by about 1.5 to 2 centimeters. And we'll do the same thing, which is drill our anchor and place our anchor. We'll then move down and complete our bank heart repair. And once we're all done, we'll move to the subacromial space. <clears throat> we'll essentially do our dissection. We're looking from a lateral portal here, working from a posterior portal. I like to do the dissection with a radio frequency wand because it avoids any risk of potentially transecting those sutures. And we'll identify those sutures, which are generally found basically at the junction of the muscle and tendon of the infraspinatus. And now we're gonna create what I call a suture staple. So we'll take the working stitch from the more inferior anchor and the passing stitch from the more superior anchor. And we're basically gonna shuttle the working stitch from inferiorly through the anchor superiorly and then vice versa for the second stitch. So we're gonna create a staple so that the sutures are linked from one side to the other, providing compression between the two anchors that will provide our remplissage repair. So you're seeing us doing this in an alternating fashion. And as we tension each of these sutures, you can see how the sutures are then linked from one anchor to the next, providing a wide area of compression uh, and completing the remplissage type repair. And we now need to simply just uh, cut those sutures. So it's a very simple uh, and quick way of managing the remplissage procedure when indicated. Now we've looked at uh, what are the results of arthroscopic surgery. And if you take away all of the papers that use things like suture tax or in, uh, incomplete indications for patients or improper techniques, you can find that we get less than a 10% recurrence rate if we choose patients appropriately and we use a contemporary arthroscopic technique as I've just demonstrated. And so I think that this can be a very valuable uh, technique for the appropriately selected patients. So for arthroscopic stabilization, it remains a viable technique. Uh, we should think about stabilizing our patients early, and I think we'll be more successful with arthroscopy. We need to avoid significant bone defects. And patients that have capsular issues or multiple dislocations may be best handled using an open approach. And finally, it is important that we uh, uh, perfect our techniques in managing these types of situations. But despite our best intentions, we know that there are still a high risk of failure in selected patients. These include patients that are of younger age with contact or collision sport activity levels, uh, technical factors are a concern either in how we manage patients intraoperatively or postoperatively. And finally, anatomic factors, either poor tissue quality with caps or laxity or primarily bone loss issues that can occur on the glenoid or the humeral side. Now, this comp, uh, concept of bone loss is not a new problem. This was actually described by uh, Steve Burkhart and uh, Joe DeBeer over 20 years ago where they noted in their instability population that if a bone lesion was absent, their success rate was under 5%. But if a bone lesion was present, their success rate dropped to only 30% with about 67% recurrence in those patients. The problem is that the glenoid does not take a joke. If we lose anywhere between five to six millimeters of anterior glenoid bone, this translates to somewhere between 20 to 25% uh, diameter-based uh, glenoid bone loss. And so we have to be very cognizant of establishing and evaluating for bone loss in the preoperative setting. How much bone loss is too much bone loss? This is, continues to be a number that eludes us. It's probably variable depending on the multiple factors that exist within a given patient. But the watershed area seems to be somewhere between 15 to 20 percent, and this has been borne out in multiple biomechanical studies. It's important to recognize that not all bone loss is the same. We can see bone loss with acute fractures where we have a sufficient amount of bone that can be primarily repaired. We can see partial attritional loss, as I showed you in our initial case, where there's bone loss with some bony bank heart remaining that allows for potential of reconstruction. And finally, we can see this complete attritional loss where there's just no bone available and some bone from an external source needs to be managed. In addition, it's important to recognize that this is a bipolar problem. So we can't just look at bone loss on the glenoid side or bone loss on the humeral side, but we have to look at how these two interact. And this has been described by Giovanni Di Giacomo and others in the concept of an on-track, off-track lesion. And the way I think about this is if you'd have a, a tire that goes over a pothole, uh, 
And unfortunately, you in India know about potholes all too well. But if your tire goes over the pothole and the pothole is smaller than the tire, you don't even know that it's there. If you go over a pothole and the pothole is larger than the tire, then the tire engages the pothole. So you can think about the tire as being uh, the humeral side and the pothole as being the glenoid side. And the problem is as the, the defects get larger and larger, the tire gets smaller and smaller. And so our chance of engaging that pothole becomes greater and greater. And there are a number of various ways to measure this, but I think that that's a good analogy to understand how these defects work together and can become significant uh, when they each approach a critical level. So this is a gray area. There's poor evidence to support treatment decisions, but I think it's an evolving um, factor that we'll start to learn more and more about and will become primarily one of the key decision-making variables that we use in deciding between arthroscopic and open approaches. But we can't just look at this alone, and I think this was alluded to in the introduction, where we can see high levels of success in low-demand patients with higher levels of glenoid bone loss, and we'll see lower levels of success in smaller glenoid bone loss situations in higher demand patients. So we have to look at the patient age and activity level, the presence or absence of a bone fragment, whether the defect is isolated to the glenoid or the humeral side or combined in nature. And then finally, the hardest evaluation that we have is what's the quality of the tissue? And I think that this is really what's affected by multiple instability events and why we see higher recurrence rates following multiple instability events. But critically, the, the best we can do right now is to accurately quantify the presence or absence of bone loss in the preoperative setting to allow us to make appropriate decisions. How do we know that we're dealing with a bone loss situation? These are some of the warning signs that you should think about. A young patient involved in a contact or overhead collision type sports who's had multiple instability events definitively needs some evaluation of bone loss. Patients that have instability in mid ranges of motion, so they say, I just reached behind me in the car or I reached down to the side and my shoulder slipped out of place. Patients that are having instability events that occur at night during sleep. And certainly patients that have failed a, a primary soft tissue procedure should have a bone loss evaluation in the preoperative setting. You can see the video on the right is a patient that had a lock dislocation over a period of three weeks, had a large hill sacs lesion with a combined bone defect. And given the, the older age of this patient, along with the glenoid articular disease, as you see, was managed with a humeral resurfacing in combination with a latter day coracoid transfer. But when you see any of these warning signs, it indicates in my mind a capsular problem or more commonly a bone loss situation. How do we quantify bone loss? Well, this is done with a CT scan. We need to make sure that we order the CT scan appropriately. We should write for a CT scan with thin one to two millimeter cuts with uh, um, 3D reconstruction and humeral, bone, uh, humeral subtraction. That's what gives us this on-face view of the glenoid. We know that the inferior two-thirds of the glenoid can be modeled as a circle. This has been shown by our Japanese uh, colleagues. And then we can use either a very simple diameter-based measurement or a surface area-based measurement in order to calculate the amount of bone loss that's present. If you're not familiar with doing this, we published our technique for uh, evaluating bone loss in the arthroscopy techniques uh, section of the journal. And I think it's very helpful to understand how bone loss measurement is done in clinical practice. I will tell you that one of the keys that I look for is as soon as you see the glenoid anterior surface being modeled as a vertical line, so you can imagine if we take away this portion of the glenoid and we simply see the glenoid as being vertical as we do in this picture here, we know that that approximates somewhere between a 12 to 15% bone loss setting. So even without measuring, if you see the anterior glenoid looking vertical, you can be assured that you're at least in a subcritical uh, glenoid bone loss situation and you should start thinking about potential glenoid reconstruction procedures. Now, the management of bone loss, we know there are multiple options on the glenoid side. We can repair, we can perform a latter J or an iliac crest bone graft. We've been using fresh allografts more and more in the United States, but I know that uh, availability of these grafts can be limited in places like India. And on the humeral side, it's primarily a remplissage plus minus a, few, a fresh allograft in very specific situations. And in older patients, as I already discussed, there may be an opportunity for limited resurfacing. Don't forget primary repair techniques. So these are two examples of patients that had acute bony bank heart fractures. On the left is a, a, a situation where we used cannulated screws for fixation. And on the right is a situation where we used a double row suturing technique. This can be accomplished arthroscopically. We do this percutaneously, either placing low profile screws, generally somewhere between two to three millimeters, as you see in the video in the top left of your screen or we do a double row technique where we place an anchor immediately along the glenoid margin. 
We pass the sutures around the glenoid fragment, and then we place two additional knotless anchors on the face of the glenoid in order to essentially secure the bony bank heart fracture, uh, fracture in a uh, soft tissue configuration. So these can be fixed successfully, and these are some of the most successful procedures uh, in regards to reestablishing normal stability of the shoulder. Now, we've already heard about how there are differences of opinions uh, between Europe and the United States, and I would uh, submit between Europe and India in terms of the use of the latter J coracoid transfer. And the reality is that the truth is somewhere in the Atlantic in terms of how we should use this procedure. I think it's overused in Europe and it's underutilized in the United States, and I would submit probably underutilized in India for managing these types of conditions. Why do we uh, uh, have barriers to acceptance for latter jade coracoid transfer? Well, as we've already discussed, the indications are unclear. The arthroscopic techniques are familiar and easy for us. Our patients are generally not followed for long periods of time. So many of us underestimate our own personal recurrence rates. And I think in many of these countries, there's lack of education and training, and this can be somewhat of a technically challenging procedure. This is just some data on trends in shoulder stabilization within the United States. And I would point your attention to this line here that shows that over the last uh, seven to 10 years, we have seen an uptick in the use of latter J coracoid stabilization. And this is the age distribution where you can see it's now being more widely adopted, particularly in these younger patients that are at highest risk for recurrent instability. And that's probably where it has the largest role. What I think we need to be better at in the future is how do we demand match the right procedure for the right patient. So there is a role for arthroscopic stabilization. There's a role for remplissage. There's a role for open stabilization. There's a role for latter J and bone reconstruction. But these roles are best established on an individual decision-making basis when we take all of the factors for a given patient into consideration and in a, a combined decision-making or shared decision-making model, decide what's the best procedure for our individual patient. There are a number of different uh, algorithms that help us to decide when is bone reconstruction appropriate. This was a Matt Preventure's original work back in 2010. Um, but we do know that these often underestimate the indications for latter J coracoid transfer. And we know that there's such a thing as subcritical bone loss. This is bone loss between 10 to 15%, where we do see drop off in both patient reported outcomes, as well as higher risk of instability, particularly in our highest demand patients. This was a, a, a systematic review that we published in uh, the American Journal of Sports Medicine, looking at bipolar issues. And basically this is where my algorithm now shapes up. If it's glenoid bone loss less than 15% with a non-engaging lesion, we proceed with a standard arthroscopic stabilization. If we have an engaging lesion with a, a Hillsax lesion, I'll consider arthroscopy with uh, remplissage. But in our youngest, most active patients, we may move to a, a, a latter day procedure. For those over 15%, we generally consider some form of glenoid bone reconstruction. And in those with a glenoid uh, lesion greater than 15% and a large engaging hill sacs, we may even add some form of a humeral reconstruction, most commonly soft tissue, but even considering uh, humeral reconstruction with fresh allografts, particularly in high-risk patients such as those with seizure disorders. Remember that most of these lesions occur on the glenoid side. Uh, and when we do see humeral-based isolated lesions, it's less than 10% of instabilities, but the vast majority of our bone reconstructions can be accomplished with a simple glenoid-based reconstruction. So I think if we go back to the initial patient that I showed you in the beginning, we have a high-risk patient, a younger patient looking to go back to contact and collision sports, multiple instability events with a subcritical bone loss lesion. I think the biomechanical and clinical data is clear that a bone reconstruction or latter J coracoid transfer is most appropriate. Why the open ladder J? Well, it's a single in, uh, cosmetic incision. It's a defined muscular interval. It avoids any graft morbidity, such as when we take grafts from the iliac crest. And it can be a, a limited learning curve and a low complication rate procedure once you become comfortable with the technical aspects of the procedure itself. We know that the ladder J works for multiple reasons. Obviously, the most significant effect is increasing the AP diameter of the glenoid. We know the conjoint tendon can also act as a sling, particularly in abduction external rotation. And finally, we can also repair the capsule so that we achieve a soft tissue stabilization in addition to the bone reconstruction. There are a number of options that we consider when performing ladder J. These include the level of the subscapularis split or potentially a subscapularis takedown, whether we place the bone block in an intracapsular or extracapsular position, and how do we rotate the coracoid uh, in order to achieve an accurate reconstruction.
For most of us, we prepare the standard uh, coracoid position. This basically uses the lateral aspect of the coracoid as the articular surface. The advantage here is that it uh, allows a very large articulation between the glenoid and the coracoid. Uh, and it also uh, provides, in general, a sufficient amount of bone uh, with a wide area for screw placement. Steve Burkhart has talked about the congruent arc modification where he essentially sits the coracoid on its side. The idea here is that we can get a wider bone block, so a, a longer area of glenoid reconstruction. And also the inferior surface may more closely mimic the normal articular radius of curvature of the glenoid. The downside, of course, is we're working with a very thin block. We have a longer lever arm on our screws, a smaller area of contact between the coracoid and the glenoid. And there's some concern about increased risk of either non-union or hardware failure when using this technique. The coracoid position is critical. This was a study by Hovelius, who's uh, done a lot of the natural history work on instability, where he found that uh, bone healing is very robust and greater than 80%. But we do know that if you place the graft too medial, greater than one centimeter, we'll have a risk of instability. And from our work here at Rush, we know that if we place a graft too lateral, we'll see significant increase in contact pressure and peak contact load that can result in increased risk of arthritis. So it's very critical that we get these graphs in a, a flush to slightly recessed position. I generally try to place them within a millimeter of the articular surface. The patient position is done in a beach chair position as you see here. We start sitting up at about 70 to 90 degrees so that we can perform an arthroscopy. And then we sit them back to about 30 degrees in order to perform the latter J coracoid transfer. This is an example of an exam under anesthesia. And in my mind, when you see these grade three instability findings under anesthesia, where you can essentially lock the shoulder in a dislocated position. So here you can see the shoulder is translated anteriorly. It's locked in an instability position and then requires a manual reduction. In my mind, that is the uh, arthroscopic or the uh, exam findings that are consistent with a uh, engaging hill sacs lesion, where we can essentially engage the lesion and it stays engaged until we perform a manual reduction. This is our technique for ladder J coracoid transfer. This was from a live procedure that I did for the uh, uh, arthroscopy meeting here in the United States about three years ago. Um, and uh, this uses a system that's now being distributed by Smith and Nephew that I helped develop uh, to help uh, standardize the approach that we use for uh, ladder J coracoid transfer. We use this bikini strap approach. It's basically about a four to five centimeter incision. It starts at the tip of the coracoid and then extends distally basically to the axillary fold. There's a variety of different instruments that we use in order to uh, help us with our um, uh, exposure. The first step is to transect the CA ligament. We leave about a five to seven millimeter stump. And then we essentially resect on the medial border of the coracoid, we resect the uh, uh, pec uh, minor insertion. We then uh, use an oscillating saw followed by an osteotome to perform our uh, coracoid osteotomy. This is done at the base of the coracoid process. You can see we're right back to the elbow, just anterior to the CC ligaments. And then there's a very nice coracoid holder here that allows us to smooth the backside of the coracoid. We like to create a nice flat bleeding surface that will allow for articulation uh, with the glenoid to enhance bony healing. And then we have a guide that allows us to place parallel screw holes that are generally between 10 or 15 millimeters apart. And we mark these positions on the backside of the coracoid. Again, we're preparing here for a standard coracoid position. We then measure the offset between these holes and what will become the articular edge of the graft. And finally, we measure uh, the, the um, screw hole uh, diameter in order to uh, prepare for the length of screws that we need. Now, my position is to do this through a subscapularis split. We perform the split at essentially the 50 yard line. Remember that the split needs to be done medially within the subscap musculature. So here we're dissecting. There are some specific instruments that allow us to uh, enhance our visualization. Once we expose this capsule, we'll split the capsule in a horizontal configuration. The first retractor that goes in is a facuta retractor within the glenohumeral joint. And then finally, this anterior retractor that goes along the anterior neck that allows us to achieve this visualization of the neck of the glenoid. We then elevate in an, a superior and an inferior direction, tagging both the inferior and the superior capsule. And you can see with these retractors in place, we get a very nice view of the glenoid neck that allows us to place our graft. We then have an offset guide that we use uh, that matches that measurement, if you remember, that we took to measure the distance between the screw hole and the articular edge of the coracoid. So we can drill our first hole in a uh, freehand uh, position. We then secure the graft with the initial screw.
We can then rotate the graph so that it aligns with the uh, articular surface of the glenoid. We can use our screw and our previous pilot hole to help direct the second screw placement. The second screw is then positioned. And we can then palpate and visualize the position of the graft. And as necessary, we can use a burr to smooth to make sure that we have no uh, protrusion of the graft itself. And then finally, I use an anchor at about the 330 position in order to uh, restore the normal inferior capsular constraint for a belt and suspenders type approach. Closures in a standard fashion. Screw type we've looked at in our lab. Uh, you can think about different uh, various screw uh, diameters, different types of screw configurations, either cannulated or solid. And the results really show that at least in time equals zero biomechanical fixation, there's no difference between a cannulated screw, a fully threaded screw, a partially uh, threaded screw. And so screw type should be at the discretion of the surgeon. How do we decide when we need to do something on the humeral side with a ladder J coracoid transfer? This is a very nice approach that was uh, discussed by Peter Millet, where they essentially do an estimated uh, uh, track calculation. So they place the coracoid process, they calculate the new diameter of the glenoid, and they recalculate the uh, glenoid track. If the humeral lesion remains off track following the ladder J coracoid transfer, then you need to consider some form of a, a, a humeral uh, engagement procedure most commonly a remplissage, or in larger defects, we can consider a humeral graft. Short-term complications have been reported as being high by J.P. Warner. In our experience, this was five surgeons from Rush, uh, about 133 patients. Our complication rate was less than 8%, or excuse me, 8.2%, but importantly, only one nerve injury in all of these patients. So I think this can be a successful procedure if it's done correctly, uh, once you're comfortable with the technical aspects of the uh, reconstruction. The outcomes we know can be very good with regard to recurrent instability. This has been shown most recently by our colleagues from Europe where they did compare ladder J and bank heart procedures. Again, this is a mixed bag of indications, but when you take all comers, the ladder J does admittedly outperform soft tissue stabilization, although with a higher complication rate compared to arthroscopic stabilization. This is our data in regards to return to sport, looking at ladder J. We can expect in our highest uh, demand athletes, greater than 90% are able to return to sport at the same level that they were um, uh, prior. The one where we have a difficult time returning to sport is in the throwing athletes. So this would be our uh, overhand throwing athletes, such as baseball players in the United States. I would venture to guess that this is similar for you with uh, cricket bowlers who require a similar type of high degrees of range of motion in order to generate velocity on the ball. We do know there are some concerns regarding the long-term results after coracoid transfer, particularly with regard to hardware failure or non-union or fracture, as well as the long-term risk of potential uh, articular disease. And therefore, this has led us to look as, in terms of, is there a better option? When Matt Preventure was here at Rush, he started to look for different types of fresh allografts that may be appropriate for glenoid reconstruction. And what he found very interestingly was that the distal tibia just seems to match the radius of curvature of the humeral head, as you see in this video on the right. The first three patients were performed in 2009. We looked at the, if this in the lab and did find that we would do a better job of restoring contact pressure when we use a fresh osteochondral graft in comparison to a ladder J coracoid transfer. And we've now looked at our results between our institution at Rush and Matt's institution when he was in the Navy and at Harvard. This was three surgeons, myself, Dr. Tony Romeo, and Dr. Matt Preventure. We did our first 20 patients. The average bone loss was about 20%, and we saw statistically significant improvements in our patient reported outcomes, no cases of recurrent instability, and overall our union rate was about 85%, and we found that it was very technique dependent. As long as we were able to get the normal screw orientation and the appropriate position of the graft, we had very uh, a robust incorporation of the graft. If we were off in the graft placement or the screw placement, we saw a higher risk of uh, non-union or malunion. And I would guess that this would be true with a ladder J coracoid transfer as well. So if we go back to the case that I presented you in the beginning, this was the open ladder J coracoid transfer that was done. You can see the appropriate position of the graft. And finally, a CT scan showing appropriate incorporation and parallel placement with the native glenoid. And this patient has now returned to sport and participated in a collegiate level for three years. So in summary, glenoid bone loss is a significant risk for recurrent instability. We need to be familiar with the uh, uh, warning signs as well as the preoperative quantification. And most defects can be managed in a glenoid fashion with ladder J being our workhorse procedure for glenoid reconstruction. Thanks very much for your attention. We'll have about 10 minutes for questions.
I do want to mention that the uh, Arthroscopy Association of North America meeting will be held here in Chicago in April of 2021. Uh, Dr. Brian Cole, my partner, will be the president of our society, and uh, I will be serving as his program chair. Uh, we've elected to have India as one of our guest nations for the event, and so I'd like to invite all of the Indian Arthroscopy Association members to submit your abstracts for a presentation. In addition, we'll uh, definitely work with your leadership to try to invite many of you to serve on our program, either in ICLs or as program faculty. And we'd love to see you all in Chicago here in uh, next year. Thanks very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Nikhil. Wonderful. It was a wonderful presentation. Wonderful. And uh, at the outset, I must thank you from uh, the Indian Arthroscopy Society for having us as uh, uh, a guest nation in the annual meeting of Arthroscopy Association of North America. And we definitely would love to be uh, actively participating in academic activities. A lot of questions have started coming in. So Deepak, would you want to start yeah, a question or yeah, can I one, start one, from the chats? One, I have just one question. Yeah. Uh, Nikhil, uh, if you are dealing with a primary dis first time dislocator, so do you, uh, that 730 anchor, is that a routine in your this thing or if, if it is a patellus postural inferior capsule, then only you do it. That's yeah, I, would, I would say that um, it really depends on the degree of pathology. I think I do it more often than not. I think that you, if you carefully examine these patients arthroscopically, you'll find that many times the label tear extends just beyond six o'clock. And in that case, I'm very aggressive about taking it down and repairing it. Um, if the capsule looks completely normal and the tear really is only say a two o'clock to 5.30, then I'll place that first anchor in the 5.30 position using the trans subscap portal. I'll still use the posterior inferior portal in order to pass my initial stitch. So I can pass the stitch at six o'clock, but I may avoid the 6.30 anchor or the 7.30 anchor in that situation. But I would tell you that it's more common that I use it than not in, uh, right. in instability management. Thank you. Yeah, Nikhil, a uh, question is, uh, is there that, uh, you see capsule is very, very important for uh, our soft tissue reconstruction. So yeah. is there a MRI sequence which uh, you guys have worked on uh, to understand how the capsule is before the surgery so that you can actually decide in a high demand patient, you would rather not do a bank cut and then directly go in for a lethargy? Yeah, I, it's a great question and I don't really know the answer to that. You know, there have been a number of studies that have looked at things like uh, overall capsule volume using an MR arthrogram to try to get a, a sense of whether the patient has some form of capsule laxity. We obviously use the Baton score to try to determine some genetic factors that may indicate hyper, hyper laxity. I think the biggest indication in my mind of a patient that's got a significant soft tissue component of their instability is those patients that have multiple instability events particularly those that have multiple instability in the absence of glenoid bone loss. That all, uh, always makes me nervous that there's a, a, a more significant capsular component at play. In that situation, then the question is, what's the right procedure? Do we add bone to make the glenoid larger than it is normally? Some would suggest that maybe in that situation, we'll see glenoid bone resorption, and that's not the right um, indication. I think in my hands, those are some patients that I would still consider for an open capsular shift versus a, an arthroscopic procedure or a ladder J coracoid transfer. I think the one limitation in arthroscopic procedure is when we, when we try to perform a plication, we're essentially just pinching capsule together yeah. versus in an open procedure, we're actually taking it down and shifting capsule in a path, pants over vest configuration, which probably gives us a much more robust repair because we're, we're looking for capsular healing between capsule and bone. So I do think that there's a role for open instability. I think it's in those patients that have had multiple recurrences with low levels of glenoid bone loss, where you really think that the capsule is a significant problem. But I, I really don't know of a way to, to objectively evaluate the capsule on preoperative pre diagnostic imaging. Absolutely. Uh, you have been using knotless anchors for your remplissage. Uh, are you happy with the pullout strength of these knotless? Because here in India, commonly we use a knotted anchors or a screw in anchors, not a push lock kind of anchor. Yeah, so this is not a push lock. It's a new anchor that's only been available in the last year. It's a knotless um, all suture. I, I prefer it to the push lock because it allows you to control the tensioning. Um, as you see, you essentially, uh, it's got one stitch, which is the working stitch, and then it's got a shuttling stitch. So what you do is you pass the working stitch, and then you shuttle it back through the anchor, and you can pull on it to tension it. As you know, for most of our patients with instability, they're young, active individuals, and it's often a male population. So I haven't found that, um, that pullout becomes an issue, but the same knotless configuration is available on a screw-in anchor as well as a push-in anchor if you get into a situation where you're not comfortable with the bone quality. But by and away, I've moved to pretty much using all suture anchors 
for all of my instability work, both on the glenoid and the humeral side. I think that it's a very small penetration um, and I can get multiple points of fixation so that I can get more anchors in a smaller area uh, in comparison to our traditional uh, hard, hard bodied anchors, which we've used in the past. Yeah, in India, actually, people have started using uh, all suture anchors on the glenoid side, but they're yeah. not very really comfortable using on the humeral side. But I think with your experience, uh, probably people would start uh, attempting to use uh, all suture anchors onto the humeral side as well. Yeah. Uh, there is a question on a subcritical bone loss, especially in a younger individual, uh, which are quite active. Would you uh, directly go in for a bone augmentation procedure in such cases, or would you still take a trial of a, a soft tissue procedure? When there is yeah, I've gotten much more uh, aggressive about managing bone loss, particularly in that patient population. So for me, it's anybody under 22 to 23 that's engaged in a competitive level of sport. Okay. So these are our high school athletes and our co uh, collegiate athletes excuse me, athletes primarily. And in those patients, if they have above a 10% bone deficiency, um, I will generally manage them with a ladder J. The problem for those athletes is, you know, if they have a, an instability event, they undergo a surgery, they lose one season of competition. If they have a second event and they lose a second season of competition, it's essentially a career ending process for them. They're never going to get back to sport. Um, they're going to lose a scholarship. They're going to lose a professional opportunity. So again, this is where I think the shared decision-making making model comes in, and we have to choose the right procedure for the right patient, understanding what their goals of the reconstruction are. Uh, do you still use an off-track, on-track uh, uh, analysis for your uh, workup to the patient for uh, deciding which kind of procedure they're doing? Or it's just theoretical. Yeah, I, I think it's, honestly, it's much more theoretical than commonly used. I think most cases are easily declared in that they have a, a critical bone loss, in which case the track concept probably becomes less relevant. But I do think it's a relevant discussion in exactly the patient that you just mentioned. So you've got a subcritical glenoid bone deficiency. Um, if you do have some humeral component, that may sway me to consider a bone loss procedure if it's engaging versus a, a soft tissue procedure with a remplissage if it's a non-engaging lesion. Um, so I think in these gray areas, it becomes more relevant, but I think as, as a common practice in our day-to-day -day operative uh, uh, schedule, we probably do it less than 20% of the time. Uh, Nikhil, in your practice, how big is a hill sex lesion so that uh, you need to put an attention towards that side? So again, I think for me, the, I use remplissage probably less than 10% of my cases. What I found is that patients that have uh, isolated humeral lesions in the absence of a glenoid lesion, these tend to be slightly older patients, primarily those that have had um, instability where they've been out for a period of time before the reduction occurred. So you'll see it commonly, for example, in somebody who's rock climbing, their shoulder dislocates, it takes them an hour or two to get to a healthcare facility in order to reduce it. Those patients may have large size humeral lesions in the absence of significant glenoid lesions. In those cases, I use um, uh, remplissage fairly robustly. But what I find is exactly what you described earlier is that generally in these subcritical bone loss cases where you generally have a 10 to 15% uh, glenoid lesion and some form of a humeral lesion, I'm moving more and more to ladder J, which eliminates the need to do a, uh, a remplissage because you make the glenoid large enough that the humeral component becomes irrelevant. Yeah, but in one of your slides, you said if the bone loss is more than 25% and you do have a, a significant hill sex as well you would combine a remplissage with a bone augmentation procedure. Less Was than 15%. Correct? Glenoid, yeah. glenoid yeah. lesion less than 15% with a humeral lesion greater than 15 to 20%. Absolutely. So would you so, do a remplissage arthroscopically and then go in for an open lethargy? Is that the combination you would do? So uh, A, I would either do an arthroscopic stabilization with a remplissage arthroscopically if they had, say, 10% glenoid loss, 20% humeral loss. If I was going to do it with a ladder J, uh, we generally do it open. And these are patients that, these are generally seizure patients or patients that have had global longstanding instability. So they've got 20% humeral loss and 20 or 30% glenoid loss, such that the, the humeral lesion is still relevant even after the ladder J. And I would do that, I would do that similar to the way that I showed you earlier. We just do it in a percutaneous approach, um, uh, looking at the hill sacs lesion or palpating the hill sacs lesion through our open ladder J transfer. I don't do that arthroscopically. Uh, and then oh, go in and okay, do the okay, open okay. procedure. Uh, there is an interesting question. I mean, you showed about a distal tibial allograft and uh, you had a, a small group doing that. Uh, but yep. in such kind of allografts, either a distal tibial allograft or a crest graft, there is no sling effect which is there, which we Correct. see for lethargy. Uh, 
So how right. does it be as successful as Latarji or even much better than Latarji? Well, remember the difference is when you uh, when you do a ladder J coracoid transfer, um, you generally are um, uh, not repairing the ca capsule as robustly. So what we try to do in that situation is we leave the capsule intact, or we or we just leave the capsule off the glenoid side. We put the graft down in an interarticular configuration, and then we repair the the uh, capsule over the top. I think it is still debatable though how much of the ladder J effect is related to the just the bone fragment itself versus related to the conjoint sling. Um, and I can only tell you that clearly the eden Hibernet procedure and or the uh, distal tibial allograft, which we now have greater than 60 cases um, between the surgeons that I discussed, shows a very robust uh, clinical outcome. So I, I think in my mind, although the conjoint sling is probably to some degree relevant and maybe even more relevant in the way that it's used by the Europeans for smaller degrees of bone loss, when you're dealing with these larger bone loss situations where you've got 30% or 35% bone deficiency, it's really a bone reconstruction game that's necessary in order to render them stable. And that's probably the primary factor that results in, um, in uh, resolution of the instability problem. Uh, Nikhil, a question about overhead athletes. I mean, again, two questions. Uh, in subcritical bone loss, would you actually go in uh, for a lethargy in an overhead athlete? Uh, yeah, I think do you feel the... lethargy does affect the outcome in the overhead athletes? Yeah, I think that the overhead athlete, as you know, they're very dependent on their rotation in order to be successful at sport. If you take an overhead throwing athlete, for example, in baseball, and they lose this external rotation, they're not going to play baseball anymore. And I would assume the same is, uh, is true of a cricket bowler. Now, the good news with those patients is that they generally are not at, at high risk for recurrent instability, meaning our pitchers are not diving all over the field to make plays, et cetera. And I would assume the same is true with your bowlers that they're less frequently involved in collision uh, aspects of the game in comparison to the batsmen or the, uh, the fielders. So in those situations, we accept a slightly higher risk of recurrence and we do a more anatomic reconstruction with the idea of preserving their motion because if you lose their motion, they're not gonna play again. Now, if it's the opposite side, I would have no issue with doing a ladder J coracoid transfer, but I think it is clear that if you overtension them or the results of ladder J in the setting of an overhead throwing athlete are yeah. uh, diminished. And so Absolutely. you want to try to avoid that when possible. Absolutely. Bhubesh, you had some question. You can unmute yourself. A uh, question was already asked and answered, sir. Okay, okay, that's perfect. Uh, Dr. Deepak. No, it's perfect. I think he has covered most of the things. Excellent. Uh, how important is an engaging and a non-engaging health sex in your practice? Would you always uh, see under anesthesia and decide whether this is an engaging or not? Or is it arthroscopic evaluation which makes you decide it's an engaging? And how does it change the way you are uh, going forward with the case? Yeah, so I, I think the take-home message here is the first thing that you need to do um, routinely in your practice is evaluate for bone loss. So if you're doing that, you're already are probably 80 to 90% of the way of being successful. And in my hands, that means that anybody who has uh, a recurrent instability problem, meaning not a primary event, uh, gets a CT scan as a preoperative study. And frankly, I can manage any of the soft tissue problems that I find at the time of surgery um, through an arthroscopic approach, or if necessary, a very small mini, mini open approach. So unless they're older patients where you're concerned about rotator cuff pathology, there's not much on an MRI scan that's really gonna concern me or change my management or really um, surprise me at the time of surgery such that uh, I don't have a solution. So uh, I would venture to, so the CT scan really should become our workhorse uh, diagnostic test in our younger patients that have recurrent instability. And what you'll find is that the vast majority of times when you have a critical glenoid lesion, uh, you can manage that on the glenoid side and you really don't need to worry about the hill sacs lesion in that situation. Now, the one time it becomes relevant is our, as we already discussed. It's these gray area situations where you've got somewhere between a 10 to 15% glenoid lesion in a high demand uh, position where you're trying to make a determination about arthroscopy with soft tissue stabilization plus minus remplissage versus a bone loss procedure. So uh, that's really the only situation where I'll truly use an on-track, uh, off-track lesion. And that's admittedly probably 10% of the time. So I think if you are just looking for glenoid bone loss, evaluating those patients that have a significant glenoid defect and managing that with ladder J, um, you're going to be successful nine times out of 10 in that situation. So Nikhil, while, yeah, 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 Deepak, please. Nikhil, while placing your anchors for Bangkok, uh, 
where do you exactly place them? Whether it is on the face of the glenoid or the edge, and do you curate the edge? Um, so I, I don't, uh, you know, I know, for example, Sugaya likes to remove cartilage on the surface of the glenoid and places anchors on that surface. Um, I like to place my anchors. Basically, I, I use the guide that looks like a, a crown. Um, and I like to place one tine of the crown on the face of the glenoid, one tine of the crown on the uh, margin of the uh, more prepared bone. So I'm essentially right on the edge. I, I wouldn't say I'm on the face, but I'm definitely not down uh, under the wall of the glenoid neck either. So I like to go right at the corner with half of my guide on the articular surface, half of my guide off the articular surface. I do think it's important that we prepare the uh, uh, glenoid neck, but I, I'm not in favor of removing articular cartilage. And I think when you do that, you're going to result in increasing loss of motion because you're putting the labrum and capsule back in a medialized position. Uh, Nikhil, uh, what is your take on a rotator interval closure? Do you do in a select group of patients which are multidirectional, unstable, or a lot of capsular laxity? That's the only time I do it. So remember that uh, you know there's been some debate about whether uh, capsular uh, closure, interval closure, uh, is best used to treat posterior instability or anterior instability. I look at it as basically a volume reduction procedure. So you're yeah. taking somebody who has a very patchless glenohumeral joint and you're trying to reduce volume. So in that situation, I'll do a basically 180 degree capsular plication using my anchor as a labrum, uh, as a uh, excuse me, using my labrum as an anchor. And then in my final configuration, I'll take an, a, a spectrum device, bite the superior portion of the subscap along with the uh, uh, medial glenohumeral ligament, and then come back out and take a second puncture just uh, through the superior glenohumeral ligament just behind the biceps. And I'll place two mattress sutures uh, stacked in, uh, in order to close the interval. So again, that's, that's a very rare instance, probably less than 5% of the time in patients that have true uh, laxity-driven multidirectional instability. Uh, wonderful. So I think there are no more questions and you have actually uh, taken your time out and uh, solved almost all the queries which came on uh, WhatsApp and uh, uh, internet chats to us. Thank you very much, Nikhil, for spending your time and we would uh, love to associate with uh, you and your team with uh, Dr. Brian Cole for the upcoming annual meeting of the, uh, the American Arthroscopy Society. Uh, thank you for spending your time and indeed uh, listening to you was uh, really a a treaty in itself. Thank you very much, Nikhil, uh, for joining in. Thank you, Deepak, for arranging thank, everything. Thank you, Nikhil. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. thanks, everyone. You know, my email was on the uh, uh, introductory yeah, slide. Yeah, it's fairly, it. yeah. fairly yeah. easy. It's nverma at rushortho.com. If anybody's in the Chicago area, we've been fortunate to host some of the members um, to uh, visit us or spend some time with us. Uh, we'd love to have you if you're traveling uh, near us. Yeah, thank sure. you very much, Nikhil. Have a nice day and stay safe. All right. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Nice. Yeah.